Okay, now we're recording. Great. All righty. Again, welcome everyone. My name is Maria Nieves, and I'm the president and CEO of the Hudson County Chamber of Commerce. Let me just make sure we are, in fact, live on Facebook here. Oh, there we go. Go live. Okay. Um, again, my name is Maria Nieves. I am the president and CEO of the Hudson County Chamber of Commerce. Welcome everybody to our session this morning. I'm very pleased that we have um, two uh, guest speakers from Genova Burns Attorneys at Law. They are um, uh, both going to speak this morning about some of the various programs that are ongoing um, to help small businesses that are out there for everyone. Um, so what I'd like to do is really turn it over to them and uh, let them take it away. Uh, they are uh, Counsel Keith A. Krause and Associate Young G. Park. Um, they are going to basically take us through this uh, presentation and answer uh, hopefully a lot of your questions about how these programs are working, how they're intended to help small businesses uh, during this very uh, difficult time. Um, and then what they'll do is at the end, they will take your questions and hopefully be able to provide uh, answers. Um, they've done this a couple of times, so I'm kind of hoping they'll um, basically have uh, you know, a lot of good answers at this point. Um, but if they don't, we can always follow up if there's a question that really is um, so outside of the box, we can follow up with all the all of you who are attending. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, just go ahead and turn it over to them. Um, and we're going to admit more people into the uh, presentation from the waiting room. You, I would just ask that everyone who is joining us, if you would just keep your um, speaker on mute until we get to the Q&A session. So Keith and Young Ji, I'll, leave, I'll let you all take it on. Morning, everybody, and welcome. I hope you're all surviving uh, this crisis as best you can. Uh, very challenging to all of us. Uh, a little bit about um, myself and Young G. We are in the uh, corporate law and uh, business transactions group of Genova Burns. Uh, the firm has offices in Newark and Jersey City, among others. Uh, from 5,000 feet, um, we're gonna talk about a bunch of programs that, have, that are very, very new, um, both federal and state, that could be available to your businesses to obtain relief. Uh, there are a couple of grant programs, and obviously grants are very advantageous to you because it's free money. And then there are a number of loan programs as well. Um, and before we, we begin, I'm, I'm just gonna say, you may have seen and heard conflicting um, positions on these various things as to who's eligible, who's not, what you have to do, um, what you can't do. And part of that, frankly, is because when Congress passed the CARES Act, um, and it's only a week ago Friday, so it's literally only 11 days old, um, they designated to the Small Business Administration, SBA, um, the, uh, the duty and responsibility for processing the new programs. So what's happened over the last week and a half is the SBA has come in and done some things which we actually think are contrary to the statute. They've overlaid some of the requirements with traditional SBA requirements. In addition, um, the, two pro the two loan programs we're going to talk about um, are applied for through yeah, banks, SBA lenders. And we're finding that there's some confusion among the banks as well. Some of them are using their own forms, their standard SBA forms that don't necessarily apply. Some of them are getting in-house counsel reads of the statute that may not be consistent with SBA um, regulations and rules. And again, bear in mind, the SBA regulations and rules are literally still coming out. So we're kind of doing this on the fly. Having said all that, 
we're going to turn now to the CARES Act, and if you can go to the next slide. Um, the CARES Act, the first thing we're going to talk about is the pay, Paycheck Protection Program. And essentially, as we'll see when we get into the details, this is a loan program that has a forgiveness feature, which if you take full advantage of, will turn the loan into a grant. Next slide, please. Who's eligible? <clears throat> There are uh, two big categories of eligibility. The first one is if you are a business that has less than 500 employees. Just make a little note um, that we're gonna tell you that there are some uh, tricky rules as to how you count the 500 employees. Or you can qualify for this program if you meet the size standards in number of employees um, in your industry, or uh, if you qualify as a small business under your um, annual revenues based upon what's called your NAICS code. So you have two bites at the apple in terms of qualifying. Give you an example, I have a client that had more, more than 500 employees but qualified because it's NAICS code and the requirements of SBA to qualify as a small business under that code qualified them. Uh, in addition to, just so you know, in addition to uh, entities with 500 employees or otherwise a small business, sole proprietorships technically um, under the statute qualify, independent contractors qualified certain self-employed individuals would also qualify. You must have been in operation as of February 15, 2020, and had either employees or independent contractors. Next slide, please. Uh, as I said earlier, in terms of counting, whether you have 500 employees or less, the SBA applies its affiliation principles. What does that mean? Go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> um, essentially, if you have other businesses, if you've created separate corporate entities um, that are owned, um, controlled by, or managed by the same people, the SBA is going to aggregate those entities and all the employees to count the 500. And that's really to prevent um, big players from coming in and let's say I own um, uh, 25 Midas muffler shops and I set each one up in a separate, as a separate corporation or LLC, um, but I, I own all of them common ownership, I control all of them, and each one has 75 employees. So if you took them one at a time, I'd be under 500, and the SBA says not so fast, because in reality, you're one big company with 25 Midas mufflers, so we're gonna aggregate all 25 of your employees so you don't qualify. That's the long and short of the aggregation principle. Um, I will note to you that the CARES Act and the Payroll Protection Program did carve out <clears throat> two sets of uh, categories of businesses that won't be aggregated. And the biggest one is franchisees. If you're a franchisee, you won't get aggregated with other franchisees, even if they're owned by common owners. And there's also a carve out for um, the uh, restaurant and hospitality industry. I don't know if any- so, Can I just jump in? On the franchisees, it has to be a franchise that's been de given a uh, franchiser designation code, identifier code um, by the SBA. So it's not all franchises. It has to have a franchise identifier code issued by the, uh, the administration. 
yeah, and just say, you know, we ran into some issues there with uh, some clients that um, said to us, well, no, don't aggregate, we're, we're franchisees. And we tried to look up whether the franchisor had the SBA certificate and we couldn't find it. And all of a sudden their franchisors were running to the SBA to get certificates. So you, you can fix that. Um, much to our surprise, um, and I think this came out literally last Thursday night, um, the SBA decided to apply uh, certain ineligibility uh, standards that exist, again, in its regular loan programs that were not express, expressly stated in the statute. So we're now living with the fact that there are certain ineligible businesses per that interim final rule that came out last Thursday night. <clears throat> so it, we list them here on the slide. If you fall within any of these categories, you are not eligible, notwithstanding the fact you have under 500 employees or are otherwise a small business. And not to, not to complain or anything, but uh, that this put us in a little bit of a embarrassing position with a couple of clients because they were processing their applications right through late Thursday uh, as if they were uh, qualified because under the statute they were and then all of a sudden this regulation came out and disqualified them and they had to stop in their tracks. So just um, again, I'll let you look at the list. I won't waste a lot of time going through it, but it would include life insurance companies. If you're located in a foreign country, um, one third gross revenue from legal gambling, et cetera. Keith? Uh, yeah. it's Maria, just a quick question that came in through the chat. Can a venture capital funded small business apply? That would, well, generally, I believe the answer is yes, subject, subject to, to, again, looking, looking at the number of employees, what, how the aggregation would apply. Um, in other words, if the PE fund um, has control even if it's a minority interest, then we're gonna to have to look at uh, the PE entity and aggregate employees, and that may result in a disqualification. Okay. Anything to add there, Young G? Yeah, I mean, you would be looking at two things. One is the size of the, of the organization that you're seeking to pay for funding. And, and two, um, this is, this list of um, ineligible businesses, the activities of the business are not um, um, deemed ineligible by the SBA regulation. Um, so um, with respect to the former, you wanna make sure that you can set whether or not there is control. Um, and that control uh, is bilateral. It's either control by um, the venture capital entity, obviously here, and then, um, and then you would be looking at um, the number of employees to make sure that you didn't um, somehow um, fall outside of the, the size standard. Thank you. Yeah, let me just back up for, for one minute. Um, again, going more from uh, 5,000 feet, the Paycheck Protection Program, and the reason why you might seriously consider that applying for this is it's a loan program um, where you can borrow up to two and a half times your monthly average payroll, and we'll define payroll in a minute. Um, and the, the, the real carrot here is uh, if you use it properly for the designated expenses during the designated period, subject to you know, layoffs, et cetera, and number of, of, of employees, that entire loan can be, for, can be forgiven. So as soon as that happens, it's a grant, it's free money. And even if you don't get all of it forgiven, the interest rate on the loan is 1% and you don't have any payments due for six months after you close a loan. Um, so there, it's a very advantageous program if you can qualify. Can we go to the next slide, please? And next one, there's, that's, this slide continues the ineligible businesses. Next slide. Okay, now we're gonna get into how you calculate the maximum loan amount that you can apply for. Generally speaking, 
it's two and a half times your average total monthly payments for payroll costs. Um, subject again to the details that we're gonna get into. So your, 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 your uh, formula here would be, you aggregate your total payroll, you subtract out any amounts you've paid to any employees over $100,000. I just lost my uh, my slides. There we go. Bear with me one second. Marie, could you get back the program? I could jump in. Um, what you do is after you deduct the excess over $100,000 in salary that's been paid, to any one or uh, more individuals, you would then divide um, that subtotal by 12 to get the average monthly cost, and then multiply that figure by two, two and a half to get your two and a half times your average total monthly cost. Um, should you have, and this should affect very few people, but should you have had taken out any um, financing from the SBA under its separate economic injury disaster loan funding, there's a refinance component to this, where you would add the outstanding balance of um, such funds that you um, obtained between January 31st through April 3rd um, to, to um, the loan amount, and that would be the basis for computing your loan amount. Keith, do you want to proceed to the next slide? Yeah, there we go. Thanks. Next slide, Maria. Payroll costs include salaries, wages, commission, or similar compensation, payments for cash or tips, pay payments for vacation, family leave, sick leave, separation payments, payments for group health care benefits, insurance premiums, retirement benefit, state or local taxes on, on assessed on compensation does not include Compensation of individuals in excess of an annual salary of 100,000. Taxes imposed or withheld um, under um, federal taxes imposed or withheld. Compensation of employees whose principal place of residence is outside the US. Qualified sick leave wages for which credit is, is allowed under the first act that was passed by Congress two and a half weeks ago called Family First and qualified family leave also under Family First. Uh, one of the issues that's come up, um, we can go to the next slide. A little controversial. Um, I think most lawyers and accountants read the, the, the act as allowing um, payments to independent contractors to be included in your payroll expense and the uh, SBA came out <clears throat> Thursday night with an interim rule saying, no, you can't include those. And that's presented a big problem for um, businesses that rely on independent contractors significantly. They can't include that, that in the computation of payroll expense. So you have a, a furniture store, for example, or a carpet store that um, regularly uses independent contractors for deliveries and installation they cannot include that in their payroll expense. In fact, this is so um, difficult for many businesses that we understand a lawsuit has been filed in Colorado um, challenging the exclusion of independent contractors from payroll uh, computation. Um, we haven't heard the outcome of that, but that, that's uh, pending. The theory that SBA has given us for not including independent contractors is that they can apply separately for the payroll protection um, program. We're finding with some of our clients that that is um, a, a paper statement because most banks, and again, this is not in the statute or the regulations, but most banks that you have to go through, you have to go through the banks, uh, are requiring in order to accept your application that you either have a business account with them and or a loan with them. 
Otherwise they won't take your application. So if you're an independent contractor and you get paid as an individual and you don't have a business account, you can't find a bank that will take your application. So it's, it's a, it's a problem. Uh, next slide. Okay, now when you get your loan, and again, you have to apply through an SBA approved lender, our suggestion to everyone is go talk to the bank where you have your business account. Hopefully you have a personal relationship with a banker there um, to help you go through the process. Most banks are um, accepting applications online, but once you close your loan, um, what can you use it for? especially if you want to have it forgiven. Um, you can use it for payroll costs. And in order to get for forgiveness, you would have to use at least 75% of loan proceeds for payroll costs, which again, we, we defined. You can use it for costs related to group health care benefits, employee salaries, commissions, similar compensation, payment of interest on any mortgage, can't pay principal, can't prepay, but you can use it for interest. Rent, utilities, specified utilities, electric, gas, um, sewer and water, I believe, um, as well as interest on any other debt obligations incurred before February 15th of this year. Next slide, please. We went right to loan terms, which you already talked about. By the way, the loan term is two years. You have uh, deferred payments, as I mentioned earlier, six months you don't, before you have to pay, 1% interest rate. <clears throat> and unlike your regular SBA loan, and unlike the EIDL or EIDL loan that we're gonna talk about in five minutes, there's no personal guarantee, which is very nice, and no requirement of collateral. And if any of you have ever applied for a standard SBA loan, you know that they crush you with the collateral requirement and the personal guarantee and the fees, and you're not gonna have to deal with that if you um, apply for this loan. Next slide. Okay, now something that you really wanna know about, if you wanna turn this loan into a grant, where they're calling it loan forgiveness. What we're gonna look at is in the future, and so you don't have to decide any of these things right now, you can still apply for the loan. Um, once you get the loan, there's an eight week covered period, they call it. And if you take the proceeds of the loan and pay them during that eight week period as required, then the entire loan or a portion of it, if you, if you don't succeed in total, will be forgiven. Again, you must apply 75%, at least 75% of the loan proceeds to payroll costs, which are defined, interest on a covered mortgage, rent, specific utility costs, electric, gas, water, transportation, telephone, internet access. Again, if you apply the proceeds to any other cost, then you will not get that, at least that portion of the loan forgiven. Next slide. Um, I'm gonna ask Young G to talk about, this is very specific about the factors affecting the forgiveness amount because they, they, they relate in part to your workforce and number of employees. Right, so um, the, the, the uh, legislative intent for the program is that um, you retain employees um, during this crisis and that you maintain them at the salaries you know, that were in place prior to um, February 15th. So um, the forgiveness amount is subject to reduction based on a reduction in your workforce or a reduction in the total salary or wages for one or more, more employees who in 2019 received um, less than um, $100,000 on an annualized basis during a single pay period. So you have to factor in um, payment of commissions and bonuses 
and annualize that to see if um, you fall under, if you have to make any considerations with respect to their salary. And it's a salary reduction of more than 25%. So under 25% would necessarily trigger the reduction in the forgiveness amount. Um, the reduction in the, in the workforce is based on a formula. Um, they look at the amount that's subject to forgiveness. Um, again, based on the slide immediately before, 75% of payroll costs, 25% of the allowable eligible costs incurred in the eight-week period. They look at that figure and they multiply it by um, a quotient obtained by um, taking the average number of full-time employees per month during the eight-week covered period over the average number of full-time employees um, during either of two periods. And um, you can choose the period that um, is most advantageous for you, but um, it would be either between February 15th, 2019 through June 30th, 2019, or um, the first two months of this year, January 1st, 2020, um, February, through February 29th, 2020. So in reality, how that works is, let's say that you had 10 employees during the 10 uh, full-time equivalent employees on average during the, the covered period. Um, and in uh, February 15, 2019 through June 30th, 2019, you had um, 10 employees. But in January 1st, on January 1st, 2020 through February 29th, 2020, you had 12. You would use the lower number as your denominator, right, the, the 10 employees from last year. And, and, and because your numerator would be 10 over 10, you would not be looking at a reduction in the, in the, mm -hmm. in the, um, in the uh, forgiveness amount. If your numerator, of course, drops, then you would be looking at a reduction um, by that portion. Um, the, the, there's an exemption in the rules, however, um, where if you had experienced a reduction in workforce or a reduction in total salary wages in excess of 25%, um, during the during the period that began from February 15th through April 26th, 2020, um, and you restore, that is, you eliminate all of those reductions um, that happened between that time period, by June 30th, um, those reductions that happened between um, that time period would not impact your, your forgiveness amount. Um, but it's very specific to those time periods. Next slide. Okay, that, that's, uh, that's it on the payroll protection program. Um, we think that is the most advantageous, obviously, because it has the forgiveness feature, which would turn the, the loan into, into a grant, as well as, <clears throat> excuse me, 1% interest rate. The next program that came out of the CARES Act is the Emergency Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. We are calling that EIDL, E-I-D-L. Uh, again, your eligibility is, is uh, parallel to payroll protection. You have to be a business that employs not less than 500. Um, you're still gonna be subject to the aggregation principles that we talked about. Um, you must be in a COVID declared disaster area. We don't have to worry about that in New Jersey because we are in a disaster area. You must certify that you've suffered substantial economic injury as a result of the COVID crisis, um, that you're unable to pay ordinary expenses, unable to meet obligations as they mature. Um, I'm assuming that most, if not all of you would be able to say that. Um, and again, this just globally, this is a loan application it's an expansion of an existing SBA program. So it's gonna have more SBA restrictions and limitations than the Payroll Protection Act, which, which is sort of uh, totally off the charts in terms of SBA. Um, so for example, as we'll talk about, there will be a personal guarantee on amounts borrowed under this program for over 200,000 the interest rate is higher, it's 3.5%. Um, you can only borrow up to $2 million. So they're, they're, this one's more limited. In addition, <clears throat> you may not use the proceeds of this loan for the um, purposes that you would use the payroll protection loan if you get that also, and you can apply for both. Next slide, please. 
Again, be aware of S SBA affiliation principles. We went through those with respect to payroll protection. They're going to apply for this uh, loan as well. And again, this loan does not have the forgiveness feature, so this is a, a pure loan. Next slide. Um, we have <clears throat> a list of ineligible businesses for this loan as well, um, which include uh, deriving one third of your annual revenue from legal gambling, loan packagers, um, in religious instruction, lobbyists, uh, et cetera. Next slide. As I mentioned, you cannot uh, borrow more than $2 million. The interest rate is 3.75% for profit businesses, 2.75 for nonprofits. Um, the SBA or the lender and the SBA are gonna set the, um, the loan term and amortization based upon the specifics of your application, but it can be up to 30 years. You may use this loan for working capital expenditures necessary to alleviate economic injury. Um, you're gonna have to give a personal guarantee for loans over 200,000, and you're also gonna have a security need, need to put collateral up, which would be security interests in your business assets, and file a UCC financing statement, which frankly, it, again, is slightly better than your standard SBA loan, if any of you have applied for one, uh, the SBA takes everything you have in collateral, including a second mortgage on your home personally. Um, there, <clears throat> excuse me, there are a list of unallowable uses for this loan that are set forth um, in the slide here, including refinancing prior indebtedness, um, payments on loans um, from other federal agencies, including the SBA, um, you, you cannot double dip uh, and use this loan for payments of uh, purposes for which you've gotten a payroll protection loan. And obviously kind of goes without saying you can't pay dividends to yourself using the loan proceeds. Next slide. This loan uh, program has sort of an interesting feature. It's the, uh, it's a, it's a grant and you can apply as part of this loan application for an immediate $10,000 grant based on need. So when your lender sends you the application forms, there should be a box for you to request consideration for a grant. And again, that's a grant, not a loan. Um, and you can use that for a number of purposes, including providing paid sick leave to employees, maintaining payroll to retain employees, meeting increased costs in your supply chain to obtain materials, making rent, mortgage payments, and repaying obligations that cannot be met due to revenue losses. So that's kind of a sweet thing. It's only $10,000, but um, it might help you in terms of your cash flow. Next slide. A third part of uh, the CARES Act is what we call the employee retention credit. Now this is not a loan and it's not, you're not gonna get any proceeds from it, but it's a credit, a tax credit um, for certain uh, payments you've made to help you uh, retain employees. Uh, next slide. You wanna talk about this one, Young G? Yeah, so the computation of the credit is based on a 50% um, rate of qualified wages uh, with respect to each employee per calendar quarter. So um, um, it's to be taken by eligible employers, which is actually described on the next slide. But um, an, an, an employer who suffered um, either a partial or full suspension of their business operations because of the COVID crisis or um, otherwise um, was uh, substantially affected by um, um, circumstances such that during the period from now through the um, end of the year, your uh, gross receipts for a calendar quarter is less than 50% um, of the gross receipts that you received in the, in the same calendar quarter last year, you'd be eligible to take a 50% 
tax credit, um, payroll credit um, against uh, employees um, uh, based on the, the qualified wages of employees against um, Social Security taxes that you paid, so or, um, that you are required to pay. Um, it can only be taken as a credit against employment taxes um, and specific employment taxes, so um, predominantly it'll be um, around Social Security, um, and you can't take more than $5,000 for the entire year per employee. So it's tax, um, qualified wages are capped at $10,000, meaning that because you can only take a credit of 50%, um, you can only take um, um, total credits of $5,000 for a year. Um, this program ends um, at the end of the year, so the wages that you can take the credit against would be um, those that are paid out um, between March 12th through, through January 1st, 2020, 2021. And um, um, there are certain um, considerations. One is that um, it can't exceed, obviously, the applicable employment taxes since there are credits against employment taxes that you're required to pay. And it will also be reduced by any other credits that are allowed under the um, Internal Revenue Code, um, Section uh, 3111 ENF. And um, the, the two credits for qualified family um, leave and uh, qualified sick leave under the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, can you go to the next slide? The, the qualified wages um, will differ depending on how many um, average uh, full-time employees you have. If you have fewer than 100, um, you would be able to treat, um, you'd be able to take the, the credit against all of your employees, um, notwithstanding their ability to work during the crisis. Um, if you have greater than 100 employees, then you would be looking at um, only taking the credits against employees who were not able to work because of the, the circumstances um, arising from COVID-19. That also being said, if you are accepting a Paycheck Protection Program loan, um, you are not eligible to take a, an employee retention credit. So that's another consideration. And economically, the, the Paycheck Protection Program, because you get um, – two and a half times the total average monthly payroll cost um, it would work out. But to the extent that somehow you were ineligible um, to take the payroll uh, protection, uh, protection program loan, um, this might be another avenue for relief. Next slide. Okay, that's, that essentially summarizes the three of the, uh, the programs under the CARES Act. And we've gone through payroll protection, which is a loan that has a forgiveness feature. We've gone through idle, which is a loan that has no forgiveness feature and the uh, employee credit. Now we're gonna turn to some state programs. Um, and these came out of legislation signed by the governor about three weeks ago and then fine tuned by the New Jersey Economic Development Authority uh, two weeks ago today. <clears throat> there are five uh, programs, although um, for all intents and purposes, there are three with an asterisk that may apply to you. Uh, there, there's a one grant program, two essentially loan programs. Well, there's actually <laughs> two loan programs that may apply to you with another that also may, but not probably not. Uh, <clears throat> the grant program is pretty limited because, um, and again, this is an application to the New Jersey Economic Development Authority um, for a grant, which again is a freebie, it's free money. You must have um, no more than 10 employees and the maximum grant you can get is $5,000. Um, if you can go to the next slide. You can use this grant for payroll and working capital. You have to give a bunch of certifications, including your best efforts not to furlough or lay off employees for six months, pledge to rehire already furloughed employees. Um, and this is limited to certain industries and they define it by NAICS code, essentially it's retail, um, hotel and food, arts, entertainment, and recreation. 
So I don't know how many of you would qualify for that, but if you do, um, go on the EDA web website and apply for a $5,000 grant right away. Um, <clears throat> the next program is an EDA loan program. So you would apply directly to EDA for this. Um, you can borrow up to $100,000, uh, up to a 10 year term, very favorable interest rate, 0% for the first five years. And then for, for years six to 10, it would be the Economic Development Authority's prevailing interest floor capped at 3%. Depending on your specifics, it may include deferred payments for up to 12 months. Um, <clears throat> the, the tough part about this one is you must be a business with less than 5 million in annual revenue. I don't know how many of you qualify for that, but again, if you do this, this could be an opportunity. You must certify that you've been significantly impacted by the COVID-19 crisis. You must, ha must have a global debt service coverage ratio of one. You are permitted to use this generally for operating expenses. You also must certify that you'll use your best efforts not to lay off employees and to rehire already laid off employees. Uh, the, the EDA started receiving applications for this on March 30th on a rolling basis. Next slide. The next program is not a specific loan program um, from the EDA. However, it is a loan program where you would go to apply to EDA premier lenders, which we'll, we'll, we'll uh, identify in, in a minute. But what's happened is the governor and legislature have authorized a certain amount of money to the EDA to guarantee loans, almost like what the federal government does with SBA loans. So the EDA is gonna guarantee certain loans that you would get from these premier lenders. And if you go to a lender to apply for one of these loans, you, you can get up to 100,000. Um, well, I'm sorry, the, the EDA is gonna guarantee up to 100,000. And it, what that means for you as a practical matter is if the EDA is guaranteeing up to 100,000 not to exceed 50% of the loan amount, then the loan terms that you would normally get from a bank are gonna be more favorable. And that would include interest rate, collateral, guarantees, et cetera, et cetera. You know, as a small business, how hard it is to get a traditional um, loan from a bank. Um, when EDA comes in and guarantees up to 100,000, those loan terms are gonna be more favorable. Um, similar to the actual loan application to the EDA, which we just talked about, in order to get this one, you also have to have less than 5 million in annual revenue certify you've been significantly impacted by COVID. Um, you can use this for working uh, capital and lines of credit. Again, must use your best efforts to not to lay off employees and to rehire already laid off employees. Next slide. Here's a list of the premier lending banks through which you can apply for this EDA loan or guaranteed loan. Includes Bank of America, Fulton Investors, M&T, PPAC, PNC, Santander, TD, Provident, Valley, Wells Fargo, and, and a number of others. So there are plenty of choices. Hopefully, um, you're, you have accounts with one or more of these banks, because again, our, our practical experience is that if you want to get these loans, you need to have a banking relationship. That's, that's where you should go and call your banker. Next slide. Um, the next program from EDA really relates to st startups or relatively new companies. Um, so the, and there's certain specifications and qualifications. Um, you wanna do this one, Young G? Uh, sure. So um, this is to incentivize um, 
is private investors who already have an equity interest in the um, small business to provide financing to um, the business. And, and what it does is it provides um, up to 80% of the total investment, not to see $200,000. Um, it guarantees um, that financing. Um, obviously, um, because it's very focused and the New Jersey Economic Development Authority is very um, um, interested in protecting the small business interests, um, it's, it's, it's for operating um, and based in New Jersey. Um, the qualifications are that your corporate headquarters are located in New Jersey, that at least 50% of your employees are, are based in New Jersey, um, that you have fewer than 25 employees, less than $5 million in annual revenues, and um, you work in one of these enumerated um, industries um, to support working capital expenditures. The last program um, that we're going to talk about with uh, through the EDA is the EDA has created uh, a loan loss reserve fund um, where it will work with community um, development financing institutions, and they're identified at the bottom of the slide, United Counties Development Corp, Greater Newark Enterprises Corp, Regional Business Assistance Corp, New Jersey Community Loan Fund and Cooperative Business Assistance Corp. So EDA will provide funds to these uh, institutions as well as guarantees for loans um, to new, that these uh, CDFIs will make to NJ businesses directly impacted uh, by the crisis. So again, that means that the, the terms of these loans would be more favorable than what they otherwise would be if you just applied to one of these community development financing institutions. I don't know offhand, I haven't looked into whether or what the requirements are to get loans from these five entities. But again, um, I, we wanted to just let you know that these are out there and that EDA is supporting loans from from these uh, community development uh, institutions. Next slide. I think that concludes the presentation. Um, and I just want to note to you that we haven't spoken about but there are out there um, certain programs that are that relate to employees and paid leave and credits that come out of the Families First Act that was passed by Congress, I believe three weeks ago. We haven't talked about that, um, but uh, the employment group at our firm uh, is available to answer questions on that if you have them. So um, we'll end right there and I guess we'll take some questions. Hi everybody, if you have a question, you can um, you can basically unmute yourself. Um, I'm going to see if I can put my full screen on. Um, you can also type a question into the chat box if you have. I do want to just note that with regards to the Small Business Emergency Assistant Grant Program that Keith and Young Ji spoke about, the grant program that will grant uh, amounts up to $5,000 that the city of Jersey City also has a program that they came out with last week where if you have applied for that grant you and you successfully get a grant from the NJEDA through that program, you can then take your, um, basically your approval from the EDA over to the Jersey City Economic Development Corporation and they are going to match the grant for you if you are a Jersey City based uh, small business, of course, you have to be based in Jersey City. There is no application process. They're basically sort of saying, if you've already been approved by the EDA, we're going to take that approval and simply match it. Um, I don't know if those funds are on a first come first serve basis. My understanding is they had something like $1.5 million that they had collected. So um, what I would do is if you do get one of those grants, as soon as you get it, uh, contact the Jersey City EDC if you are in fact a Jersey City based business. Um, I'll just start with a couple um, of questions that did come in through the chat. Um, 
So there was one question that came in, can a startup or existing a business that's just been existing for a few months in 2019 apply for the EIDL? So <clears throat> under the, the CARES Act provisions um, that pertain to the Emergency Economic Injury Disaster Loan um, Program, which is um, an expansion or relaxation of the economic injury disaster loan, the existing economic injury disaster loan program um, administered by the SBA, there's a waiver of the requirements that um, the, the applicant, the small business applicant, needs to have been in business for the one year period um, before the disaster. The, the caveat being that it had to have been in existence um, in operation. Um, on January 31st, 2020. So um, given that you're looking at a startup that was in existence in 2019, um, you should be eligible for um, application for an idle loan. Um, and then there's another question that came in. Um, what loan grants, not PPP, are available for commercial mortgage or rent liability, workers' comp insurance, and other overhead such as health insurance? Yeah, so, um, and I'm just, I'm gonna qualify my response um, immediately before. You just have to also make sure that you're looking at the ineligible purposes and make sure that you qualify. Um, there will be some um, likely back and forth because the amount of the idle loan will be based on need. So you'll probably, you will have to provide um, um, you, you, the underwriter will probably be looking for some information pertaining to um, your express need. Uh, sorry, and then going to the, the next question. Um, so first I'm gonna hit the second part, which is that you didn't include the healthcare payments, um, the group healthcare payments that were included in uh, the definition of payroll costs when you apply for PPP, if you can amend. Um, that should be something that you direct to your lender because um, to the extent that they've already submitted it, um, I don't know how accommodating they will be because the, the program itself is a first come first serve program. Um, so you should probably be reaching out immediately to your to your bank um, to whom they submitted the application to see where they are in the processing of your application and whether or not they can accommodate a, an amendment of, of the same. Um, what you don't want that, is, to, is to be put it in the back of the queue. Note that um, you, you will not be eligible to submit another application. Um, one of the certifications that you make in your application is that you will not um, uh, be um, eligible for uh, financing under the Paycheck Protection Program um, between now through the end of the year, December 31st. Um, what loans grants? So um, we did talk about the idle financing. So under the CARES Act, and this is really just for um, small businesses because there is financing from the Treasury, not the greatest, but the financing from the Treasury Department um, for, for mid-sized businesses. But um, the idle program may be um, another avenue. It, it does allow for the coverage of costs not covered in the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, uh, which, in, you know, is generally um, looked at as working capital types of expenses, payment of vendors and, and the like. The only thing is, is that you have to make sure that your documentation is um, very tight because um, you cannot use the proceeds of the idle financing um, to pay for the same purposes of the um, Paycheck Protection Program. Um, and that um, violation of that um, prohibition will be... Um, will not put you in, in a good position. And there's another question here regarding the PPP, and it's what is the date of the origination of the loan? Is it the application date, or is it the dates that the loan funds are actually received? Date you close your loan, date you get the money. Right. Starts, um, the, starts the eight weeks. Right, and then um, there's a question here about how, can you restate how you access the emergency grant. I think they're referring to the Small Business Emergency Assistant Grant Program from the EDA. How do you ex access that? That you go sure. to the EDA website. They're, they have an application so, online. You're applying right to the EDA. Right, so, so the, the SBA has a streamlined application process for the idle financing. So if you're looking for an emergency economic injury disaster loan stemming from this um, crisis, um, you would 
submit the application. It's literally four, four pages of data about your business. Um, the only financial data that you have to put in is uh, your gross revenues for the, the past 12 months um, and your cost of goods sold for the same period, um, should you have any. And then um, there's a check the box question as to whether or not you want to be considered for a $10,000 emergency um, grant. And you have to check the box in order to be considered. If you don't do that, um, you will be considered for the, the emergency grant. Yeah, you're basically applying for the idol. As part of that application, you check the box for the ten thousand. And I just what I just mentioned was the EDA five thousand dollar grant. Those are two two different things. Great. I have a, a question. Um, so if I am a small business and I've had to furlough employees, but then I apply for the PPP, am I still eligible to apply for the PPP? I, that just assumes then that I'm going to rehire those employees. If I get those funds, how does that sort of work? Yeah, you're eligible. Um, if you calculate your average monthly payroll up to today, you, you're going to have um, less payroll to the extent, a slightly less payroll to the extent that you've laid off some people, but you will determine your loan amount based upon that figure times two and a half. Um, and then the question becomes how much gets forgiven and that will turn on whether or not you rehire those employees and how much money you spend on your payroll starting that eight week period from the date you get your loan but you still are um, eligible so just a clarification um on one of the slides in the desk there was a formula for um the reduction in workforce um, if you experience a, a reduction in workforce between February 15th through April 25th of this year, um, and you restore, you eliminate um, those reductions, uh, that reduction that happened within that finite period would not impact your forgiveness amount. But if you don't restore it, you would be looking at a reduction in the forgiveness amount by the ratio of the total average the average total um, full-time equivalent employee um, employed by you over the eight-week covered period um, divided by, um, you know, the number of average total uh, full-time equivalent employees in one of the two periods that we discussed previously. Um, now, just the caveat, um, the exemption um, from the adjustment to the forgiveness amount is only applicable for reductions that happen within that finite period that are restored by June 30th. If your numerator, presumably, and there hasn't been much guidance in it, but based on just the mathematical computation of the of the way they're looking at the reduction in figure, the forgiveness figure, um, you would be advised to to look at your um, average number of full-time employees that you would be maintaining during the eight-week period over. Um, the average number of full-time equivalent employees that you employed in either of those two time periods to, to understand the impact. What, what I've been suggesting to clients is as a practical matter, as a business person, um, don't worry too much about the forgiveness right now. Apply for your loan, get, get the maximum amount you can borrow. And as you, when you get your, your closing date scheduled that week before, um, look at the circumstances surrounding the health crisis, where we are, whether, whether there's any indication things are going to be um, freeing up. You're going to do a new business assessment is my point. And, and at that point, um, you can make a decision applying the forgiveness principles, whether or not to bring people back on board if you need to. Um, because at the end of the day, even if a portion of this, this loan is not forgiven um, because you, you make a business decision that it is economically better for you um, not to get the forgiveness um, and to just accept a repayment of the loan at 1%. But my, my suggestion to you is, and I'm sure as business people you will do this, it's an economic decision that you are gonna make based upon the circumstances that exist right at, at or shortly before the time you get your loan. And as we've seen so far, 
things are changing every day. So that, that's my, my suggestion to you. I have a question. Can I, it's complicated. I don't want to type the whole thing out. Can I just talk for a sec? Go ahead. Introduce yourself, Lisa. Okay, sure. My name is Lisa Wells. Um, I have two businesses and I'm specifically speaking to my construction business. So our overhead um, is very high with the mortgage on the property as well as our liability and workers comp. I was the one asking that question. Um, the thought of taking out a loan, um, it, it sounds to me like I would just be driving myself out of business in the future instead of right now. Like I can't imagine paying off that kind of loan for those kind of expenses. So I'm just saying that that's like my state of affairs, but I've also been advised and I, you know, I don't know where we are with this, but some Thing during the Sandy uh, experience, people applied originally for loans and disaster loans. And those people who had already been a, had applied and approved for disaster loans were then ineligible to apply for disaster grants, even though that's really what they needed, but that wasn't available originally. So I, I kind of don't know what to, not that you should advise me, but <laughs> <laughs> like, are, do you expect to have more grants available for, I'm not, I'm not in the industries that were listed. I'm not in the food service industry or any of those things for that other grant of the $5,000 um, or up to $5,000, whatever. Um, should I apply anyway, even though I'm, my business quote unquote, isn't in the right NCIS code that they're listing? Um, thoughts on that? It's a lot of questions. So um, on the NJEDA financing, I mean, the, the amount available, um, you know, they it was, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a limited amount um, in terms of availability and they were expecting um, large volume and applications. It started um, last Friday um, and I imagine that it will likely close, um, well, they were projecting it to close tomorrow. Um, if you don't meet the, the requirements because you don't fall under the um, next code that was provided in the application materials, it's probably futile, but you know, you want to make sure that you're correctly um, identifying your, your next code. So, you know, you might want to revisit that and make sure um, before you completely um, disqualify yourself. Um, secondly, um, under the care, under the CARES Act, uh, you know, for small businesses, um, the big chunks of um, financing were those that were discussed um, today in terms of low interest loans and 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 what amounts to um, um, grant funding uh, it might be worthwhile the exercise of uh, an application for idol i know that in one of the sba um, hosted uh, seminars they were encouraging people to apply um, you know, particularly because you get to avail yourself of an up to $10,000 emergency grant and you have, you know, between, you have up to six months to accept or reject um, the loan. Um, so, you know, if you get approved, you don't necessarily have to accept the loan. You just have to understand that um, with respect to the grant funds, should you also receive a paycheck protection program um, loan, it might affect your forgiveness number there, which um, isn't necessarily um, help. But um, I think the only other thing is, um, you know, I know that there are a number of organizations um, who are also um, in the private sector looking at um, grant programs. And it's a little um, early in the stage, I think, because um, so much has been, you know, so many of um, the organizations have been looking at, at you know, how um, the, the CARES Act and the stimulus package from from the um, from Congress uh, was going to be helping uh, the businesses that are in distress because of the disaster. So um, from government sources, I mean, if you're not in a place to take a, a low interest loan, again, like the uh, New Jersey Economic Development Authority, the the loan program that um, contemplates an up to one hundred thousand uh, dollar low interest. I think it's actually it may even be zero percent um, interest loan. If that's not something that can at least tide you over until um, such time that you're generating um, revenue to meet your operating expenses, 
um, I would say keep an eye out on the, the private market for um, financing that's supposed to be coming through. Um, I mean, that were announced early on. I know when we were first looking at this, um, I think um, there was uh, an initiative that Facebook may have um, been contemplating. Again, I haven't seen much more information in, in that regard, but it could be because there's been so much energy attention focused on um, the, the Paycheck Protection Program that um, that might be a uh, subsequent wave. Um, I also know that there's been, um, you know, bills introduced in Congress um, about recovery financing. We just don't know where they are. Um, I would just say keep um, checking um, our sites and, you know, to the extent that there was an update, we would be um, working to, to announce those in due time. Not to belabor the point, but if I'm hearing you correctly, what you're saying is, right now you don't have the financial ability to carry any more debt. So if, if I were in, in your position and uh, from, we can't comment on, on the Sandy legislation because I'm assuming it was different. We haven't, we didn't look at that, but if, if you are, are saying you do not have the ability to carry any more debt, um, then these debt, these loan programs may be just irrelevant to you. So what I would do if I were you is I'd look for the grants. The $5,000 grant from the state, probably you're not gonna qualify for. The, um, but there are two, two pieces that might be of some advantage. The one is the payroll protection loan to the extent it's gonna be forgiven. So unlike what I said earlier about making that decision the week before, you may need to analyze the forgiveness feature now and see whether that's of any benefit to you because you need the grant you need it forgiven. You don't. You can't carry the loan. Secondly, uh, as Young G just said, you may want to apply for the idle loan just to get the ten thousand dollar grant. And then, if you get approved for the loan, say no, I don't want the loan. Um, and if if necessary, although being mindful that you have to be able to, and it sounds like you will make the certifications that are um, pertaining to that funding. Yeah, well, I'm assuming that. I'm just saying, it sounds like you need the grants. So speaking of the, the PPP program, um, a quick question that came in, um, are there local providers helping small businesses prepare the application forms or are folks working with their accountants? My understanding is you need to work with your bank. Can you address that? Yeah, it's with the banks. Each bank is a little different. Each bank has their own process. You don't have to go to your bank. You can go to any SBA approved lender, but the, the, from what we've heard, and I have not heard one exception, maybe you have Young G, I have not heard of any SBA approved lender that is taking applications from someone they don't already have a banking relationship with. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, yes, you're gonna have to use your accountants because a lot of the backup materials let me back up. You're going to get an application from your lender, okay? Most of them are, are getting them online. And that application, uh, from what we're hearing, um, you're going to have to check off the boxes um, and you're going to have to provide backup. What is that backup? Payroll records, tax returns, um, all in support of the calculation of your payroll amount and the loan amount applied for. So we've received calls from clients. Hey, my bank is asking me for my 941s. Can you help me? What can I get them? What should I do? Well, we don't have your records. You're going to have to call your accountant and get your records. So yes, you, you're going to have to work with your lender and your accountant to pull together the stuff you need to attach to the application and back up. There is a technical assistance program administered by the uh, New Jersey Economic Development Authority that is um, that purports to assist in um, the preparation of applications for funding uh, to state and federal agencies that might be um, an, an available resource for you. The problem is, is that um, you know it was announced kind of contemporaneously with the funding, so um, I don't necessarily know um, how. Um, whether or not they're, they've set themselves up to um, take applications um, for that kind of assistance. Um, we can provide to Maria after this call a link to um, the NJEDU website that talks about that particular program. 
Right, you can actually, um, thank you for that, Young G. You can actually find a lot of the links to um, the NJEDA on the Chamber website. They're also just easy to find. Um, and I would recommend to everyone the New Jersey State COVID-19 um, site. So if you just type in uh, New Jersey government, um, you can find the site really easily. The link is on our website. Um, I think they've done an amazing job here in New Jersey, uh, fortunately, with um, creating a portal that has a lot of frequently asked questions, is easy to navigate, and can take you to a lot of the resources on a state level, um, which is fantastic. Uh, so I don't want to keep uh, folks much longer. It's almost 12.15, but I think we've had a, a good conversation. Um, I just wanted to ask Keith and Young Ji, any any thoughts about when you think funds from the PPP program might actually start to flow, uh, considering what you're seeing out there? Well, I'm not, I, I'm not trying to stump you either. <laughs> no, we, we've um, been on the phone with uh, lots of clients in the last, uh, it'll be two weeks tomorrow, um, helping them prepare applications, what should, what should I do? And from what we understand from every, every person but one, um, is that they've made their application. One person has said to me, the bank has confirmed that they've approved the application and have submitted it to SBA. So that's the furthest I've heard anyone has gotten. Um, we understand that billions have already been applied for. Bear in mind, this program uh, has, is funded for 349 billion. You may have read in the press that um, uh, Trump and Congress are considering adding another 250 to this program, 250 billion, because it's so popular. But I haven't heard of anybody getting the money yet or even scheduling closing, so. Uh, well, um, just to jump on that though, um, I, I understand that um, Vice President um, Mike Pence has tweeted that um, $71 billion has been um, quote unquote dispersed. So, um, you know, um, I think banks have gotten a lot of pressure to get the money out quickly. Um, you know, it's a first come first serve program. So, you know, um, to the extent you haven't submitted your application and you're eligible to qualify uh, to, to a pool, you should, you should be looking at submitting your application sooner rather than later because it seems they are moving. Right. Thank you for that. And, and plan accordingly, I, I guess, uh, with regards to how soon that process is going to move along. Um, I want to thank uh, our speakers, Young Ji and Keith. Uh, for joining us today and taking time out of their incredibly busy schedules. I know that you all must be getting uh, just a ton of questions about all of these programs. I guess one last thing would be to just advise folks if there is um, additional monies and funding that become available, whether through a private entity or a state, you know, the NJEDA or a fed, another federal program, that they should continue to stay um, stay alert and connected uh, so, so that they can take advantage and understand what, what other opportunities might come up, correct? Yeah, we will be um, blogging and blasting on our, our website um, with respect to any and all new programs. So, you know, if you want to go to, you know, genovaburns.com, um, it'll be there as soon as we know about it. Can I share this presentation with those who registered today? Can I send it along to them or? As far as I'm concerned, sure. Okay, Confirm with, with Tammy. Okay, gotcha, will do. All right, again, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Um, I wanna particularly thank Keith Kraus and Young G Park. Again, they are with Genova Burns Attorneys at Law. They are a member of the Hudson County Chamber of Commerce. So I can either connect you to them or you can connect yourselves um, to them. And um, thank you all for your questions and taking time. I'm going, this has been recorded so we're going to also share this uh, with our members through various channels. So thank you again for your questions. Um, thank you for joining us. I hope everybody continues really to stay, stay safe and stay healthy, okay? And have a great- Thanks for having us, Maria. Thank, thanks for having yes. us, Maria, and thanks for joining us. Safe, everybody. All righty, enjoy the weekend, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>